Hey everyone, welcome back. This week we're going to take a look at what we call common ethical issues. At the beginning of the class we started off by looking at the, the Madoff case and the textbook looked at the, uh, the financial collapse of 2008 and uh, some of these huge, very complicated systemic ethical failures. Well, hopefully you won't be party to one of those larger issues, but chances are uh, if you work in management for any length of time, you will run into some fairly common, predictable kinds of ethical issues. And so this week, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the, the bread and butter, more common kinds of issues that you are more likely to run into. And we're also going to start off by, uh, by looking, something, look at it, looking at something called voicing your values. And voicing your values is an approach to sort of pre-thinking about what your response might be when you run into an ethical dilemma. You know, if you're, in, if you're involved in the military, uh, public safety, law enforcement, etc., you spend a long time drilling and rehearsing and going through common scenarios so that when you get to those issues in real life, you'll already have a repertoire, a, a reservoir, so to speak, of things to pull from. You'll be trained, so to speak, on how to respond. Because the challenge when you're in these tough, fight or fight kind of situations that you just kind of get caught up in the moment. And so it's it's a similar idea in ethical decision making is that if you can practice, if you can think through uh, your own typical response to types of things, your own values in a certain sense, uh, when you actually get to an ethical decision point, uh, you will be able to make that decision based on a, a pre-thought out approach that you have. Not that you've thought about every potential ethical dilemma uh, that's going to arise, but but how you might typically respond to ethical situations, right? So that makes sense? So we'll start off the lesson by talking about that, and then we'll go into what the uh, what some of the common types of uh, common types of ethical situations are. And typically you look at things like people issues, conflict of interest, customer confidence issues, uh, and use of corporate resources. We'll also talk about uh, how to blow the whistle and that sort of become common in some of these high-profile cases as well where somebody, some integrous uh, ethical individual finally says enough I can't stand it anymore and they pull out their big whistle and they blow on this thing as loud as they can and they, the, the jig is up at that point. That way they get people's attention uh, and finally some action is taken after they've uh, exhausted all their internal uh, resources. So I hope you find this useful. Uh, we're going to do a narrated PowerPoint. So follow along on the slides and we'll get more into depth into all these things. Our lecture this week will be based primarily on Chapter 4 of Trevino and Nelson's Managing Business Ethics. Here's the topics we'll cover. Giving voice to value, people interests, I'm sorry, people issues, conflict of interest, customer confidence issues, use of corporate resources, when all else fails, blowing the whistle. Now, the first section we want to talk about is what's called voicing your values. And as I mentioned in the introduction, this is a way of pre-thinking your own values when it comes to ethical decisions. And if you do this, if you can come up with a profile, so to speak, of different things, your own personality, your own preferences, uh, that would determine how you address ethical issues, it will help you when they come up in the future. And again, you're not going to be able to pre-think every situation, but if you pre-think a response, it will help you when the going gets tough. So the first thing you want to think about is your purpose. What are your personal and professional goals? What do you hope to accomplish? What would you what would make your professional life worthwhile? All right, so this is some of those kind of larger cosmic uh, meaning and, and purpose kinds of issues. And I think we all have to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of legacy do I want to leave? Uh, what kind of a leader do I want to be? How do I want people to think of me? Uh, am I willing to stand up for, for what I believe? Is it, is it that important to me? The next thing you want to think about is risk. Now, some people have a high risk tolerance and some people have a low risk tolerance. And so you want to ask yourself, what is your risk profile? Are you a risk taker or are you risk averse? What are the greatest risks you face in your line of work? What levels of risk can you live with and which are ones you can't live with? The next one is personal communication style or preference. Do you deal well with conflict or are you non-confrontational? 
Do you prefer communicating in person or in writing? Do you think best from your gut and in the moment, or do you need time to reflect on and craft your communication? So you, you could see why this one obviously would be important when coming to ethical decision. Some people are very quick on their feet. Uh, some people really have no problem dealing with conflict. You know, some people actually like dealing with conflict. They're a bit competitive. Uh, other people are the exact opposite. They would rather never deal with conflict, right? Okay, so you can see if there's going to be a, a situation in a, in a corporate setting, in a work setting, where, where there's values in conflict, and you are, you, know, you are the one tasked responsible for helping people see through and making decisions, uh, if, for example, you are non-confrontational, what do you think that's going to mean for your, your, your tolerance for addressing the conflict situation? Well, chances are it's going to be your inclination to run away, uh, to sweep it under the rug, to hope that somebody else deals with it, right? Okay, so uh, if you identify yourself as a non-confrontational sort of person and you spell that out and say, yeah, this is how I... Uh, this is how I, I deal with life. And maybe it's even a cultural issue. Some cultures are much more outgoing and they deal with issues right up front. Some cultures are much more what's called face saving. And you don't really deal with this issue and you don't confront. So perhaps your cultural background is one where you're non-confrontational. Non how will you deal with that when it comes to an ethical situation? These are important things to, to pre-think through so when the situations arise, you know how you're going to deal with it. Another personal uh, value is one of loyalty. Do you tend to feel the greatest loyalty to family, work colleagues, your employer, other stakeholders such as customers? Right. So where are your primary loyalties? Uh, we had a case study early on in the class which had to do loyalty uh, to a friend uh, versus loyalty to a boss. Right. And uh, the, the boss gave you some confidential information about the long-term success uh, viability of the organization and said, shh, don't tell anybody. Uh, but you knew that your best friend was just about to put a down payment on a house and that if he got laid off, uh, it would be a disaster. So where are your loyalties? Uh, next one is self-image. Do you identify yourself as being shrewd or naive, as idealistic or pragmatic, pragmatic uh, as a learner, as a teacher? Now, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about some larger uh, kind of concerns, uh, dimensions, if you will, of organizational life. And we talked about this in organizational behavior for some of you who took it. Uh, we talked about equity theory and how everybody really has this, this deep, innate sense uh, of equity that's built into them. I believe it's a God-given uh, sense that, that we all have and that it really comes to bear, it comes to play when we when step into the work situation and we're dealing with potentially ethical issues. So some of the ideas related to fairness is equity. Do people working equal, uh, equally hard receive equal wages? Reciprocity, if you do this, I'll do that. Impartiality, are you unbiased? So these are all expectations that people have. They expect to be compensated for their hard work. Uh, they expect it to be reciprocated with. And they expect that uh, leadership is going to be unbiased. Now, so, okay, so that's some of the larger kind of uh, cosmic, not cosmic, but sort of the larger uh, contextual issues that frame uh, ethical discussions. Now, let's talk about some of the common types of issues that you're going to deal with, chances are, as a manager in the workplace. All right? Uh, a couple of the common people issues are discrimination and harassment. Now, discrimination can be defined as Unequal treatment based on one's race, gender, ethnicity, national origin, race, religion, ability, uh, or age, etc. All right. Now you can see right away we had just talked about the uh, fairness idea, right? And so it's not that hard to make the leap here that discrimination is an inherently unfair practice, and so people don't like that. Uh, when you are in the workplace, you need, need to make decisions solely upon one's work performance, upon their ability, upon their job performance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so when we start to bring these other factors in, and again, let's face it, sometimes we have biases, we have stereotypes, uh, we have negative perceptions of people from a certain group. And so these can begin to bias us uh, to color our decision making, right? And this, this is inherently unethical, and we need to be able to... Uh, to, to define this, to spot it, uh, to see it in others when discrimination is taking place. The standard for hiring, promotions, etc. should be 
the ability to do the job. Okay, so whenever that is not the sole standard, i.e. the ability to do the job, then you could say that discrimination is taking place. Now another big one, and this has gotten a lot of press in the last uh, you know, 15, 20 years or so, is what's called sexual harassment. Now this, this is broken down into a couple of different types here. There's what's called quid pro quo. Uh, this is a fancy Latin term for this for that. It's where sexual favors are a requirement or seem to be a requirement for advancement. Okay, so the classic uh, scenario here is, uh, is when uh, the boss comes up to his female subordinate and says, you know, I got a really good assignment here, and, uh, you know, if you go out with me on a date, uh, I might be willing to give you that assignment over uh, somebody else. Okay, so it's this idea that, that, that somebody uh, will be rewarded if they, uh, you know, give in to this guy's sexual advancements, all right? Now, the other one, which is probably more common nowadays and that we have to be very sensitive about is what's called hostile work environment. This is when a worker feels uncomfortable because of unwelcome comments or behavior of a sexual nature. Now, uh, HR law is expanding and, and a lot of this stuff is, is codified now. Uh, we really, this isn't a law class, this is an HR law class per se, um, but just to give you the basic idea that uh, that we cannot create an environment where people feel uncomfortable because of unwelcome comments or behavior. And another thing, too, is, is even an environment where there's uh, uh, pictures, posters, etc., etc., that might feel make people feel uncomfortable, all right? So long gone are the days where you could have your, you know, your pinups, uh, guys, where you could have your, you know, your sexy pinup girls hanging in your, uh, on the walls in your cubby, cubbies or whatever, right? This is what's called creating a hostile work environment. Now, the next main area is what's called conflict of interest. Uh, this is where there's the intersection of professional and personal interest and can be defined as uh, if your judgment or objectivity is compromised or could a third party think it's compromised by a relationship you have with an individual in an organization. And notice where it just says the third party could think that it's compromised, right? So it doesn't actually have to be compromised. It can just be the perception that you are making a decision, that you are favoring one party over another because of a previous relationship you have with that person. All right, so this is a perceived conflict of interest, but it still uh, can be seen as an unethical issue. And again, this is a tough one because in some cultures, uh, we some cultures give preference to family members, to close relationships, to people who've uh, uh, helped them out in the past. And we'll talk about bribes in a bit here. But uh, you need to avoid a situation where it can be perceived that you are favoring one party and over, uh, that your, your judgment or objectivity is clouded because of a previous relationship that you have with, uh, with them. So a classic example of this one would be, uh, you know, say you are in charge of purchasing, right, or a decision-making awarding a contract. And uh, your brother-in-law happens to have a country, uh, country, uh, a company, and they're a general contractor. And you have to find a general contractor on behalf of your company. And uh, you have lunch with your brother-in-law one day, and you're telling him about work. And he says, well, you know what? Uh, my, my firm can do a job like that. Great. Yeah, we do stuff like that all the time. And tell you what, uh, bro, I'd even cut you a good deal. Uh, I'd even, you know, uh, uh, come in under budget for you and uh, make you look good, and you're thinking, boy, this, you know, this is the guy who's married to my sister, and uh, he's going to make me look good, and he's going to give me a, a, a good price. You know, what's the big deal here? Well, you know, the, the, the fact is, if he does do a good job and he comes in, comes in under budget, there's really no big deal. But if you went straight ahead and hired that guy, well, guess what? People are going to think there's a conflict of interest that you hired your brother-in-law. So does that mean your brother-in-law can't do the work for you? Uh, no, it doesn't. You don't have to automatically exclude your, exclude your brother-in-law from the bidding process just because you know, you're related to him. But you need to have a fair and open bidding process, and your brother-in-law and his firm can be one of the companies that bid for it, right? So if you have an above-board process where everybody knows the rules, where everybody submits their bids on time, where they follow the same protocol, and then you review them all, and I would even, uh, I would even rec recuse myself 
and recuse yourself is that's kind of a, a fancy legal term which means take yourself out of the decision process uh, so therefore other people are making the decision now you're, you're getting your brother-in-law a seat at the table and he has a chance now where maybe he wouldn't because he knows you but you are not in there making the decision and pulling the strings and seeing that he is the one who gets the job right so so you allow him to compete just like everybody else you recuse yourself from the decision-making process and voila uh, nobody can say that you had a conflict of interest that you unfairly uh, selected him over others and if he, if he gets the bid great and you can say hey this guy competed just like everybody else I didn't make the decision everybody else did uh, etc etc all right so that is conflict of interest let's move ahead here uh, here's some particular ones here and we talked a little bit about these right um, over bribes and kickbacks subtle bribes uh, and again, this would be the scenario where, you, where you, maybe your brother-in-law took you out to lunch and said, uh, he said, hey, you know what, um, if you give my firm the, uh, the job here, uh, uh, I'll pay for that uh, vacation that we were going to go on uh, next week with the families, you know, and I know that's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars. And tell you what, no problem. I, I was going to treat you anyhow, right? I was going to bless you and my sister. Uh, so, uh, so let's do it. What do, you, what do you say? All right, so that's, that's a bit of a subtle bribe. You know, especially if he started talking about that uh, before the bidding thing came up, he maybe had in the back of his mind, all right? Uh, using influence, uh, privileged information. Uh, and then this last one, boy, this is the one that gets uh, people in the financial world in trouble all the time, right? Where they have some backstory, where they have some information, maybe about a direction that, uh, that a company is going. And, and legally speaking, these folks have to take themselves out of decision-making process. They're, they're not allowed to invest. Uh, there's a lot of regulation. Again, this isn't a finance law class, but that's an example of the kinds of uh, misuse of information that you might have uh, that can help you take advantage to get an ad advantageous position uh, in, a, in a financial sense. Okay, the next category here are what are called customer confidence issues. And the main ones here are confidentiality, product safety, truth in advertising, and then there's special fiduciary responsibilities. Now, what's confidentiality? Well, we know a lot about this because it seems like every time you sign up with a new company, uh, you get a big booklet in the mail, or you have to read a giant disclaimer on their website uh, which says click that I agree uh, their terms of service uh, which says that uh, that they will not disclose your information to anybody right and in this dig digital age it is so easy to share information I think a lot of consumers are kinda caught up on that because they're afraid that if they sign their name if they enter their you know information in a text box on a web page you know boom before you know it their information is gonna be sold and they're gonna be solicited by uh, uh, by other people. And of course in the medical profession uh, this is extremely important, right? Because sometimes there's sensitive personal information that you really don't want to get out. And if you've been to the doctor lately, uh, boy it seems like you gotta sign pages and pages of waivers. Uh, they have to go out of their way above and beyond to, to promise you that, that your information is going to be confidential, whatever. Okay, so, so the public, especially in this digital age where things go viral, uh, is extremely leery of confidentiality. Uh, sadly, this is something that gets breached all the time because of the, uh, the, the, the digital connectedness of this world. And there's a lot of uh, nefarious people out there with a love to just hack into somebody's server to take your information to spread it worldwide, right? And that's happened, sadly. We see that happen again and again. Um, and so you really can't be too careful on it. I'm afraid there's not a whole lot that consumers can do in this day and age uh, if they want to do e-commerce, if they want to, you know, do anything in, uh, over the internet, chances are you're going to have information that is out there that potentially could be hacked. Uh, product safety, this is another big one, and we already looked at the Pinto, uh, the Pinto fires case, and this is kind of a classic in business ethics, uh, which sort of set the bar. And, and again, back in the day, back in the 50s and 60s, as uh, corporate America was emerging, as, you know, marketing was going nuts, really, uh, corporations weren't quite as concerned with product safety uh, but nowadays boy it seems like uh, people go out of their way companies bend over backwards and have you ever noticed uh, even the simplest of products will have some sort of uh, disclaimer label on it right have you ever wonder why you know you could buy a you know I don't know you could buy a bucket right that you're gonna clean your garage with and it'll have a disclaimer on there you know warning this is not a toy warning this is not a safety device 
uh, you know, warning, do not carry anything more than, you know, 22 gallons in this, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, you might get a hernia if you lift anything too heavy. Now, being a little silly here, but, but you get the point, you know, corporate America now is, is very, very, uh, goes out of its way to, to disclaim, um, rather disclose any potential liability that their products might have. And even so, you know, we still see that companies get in trouble when their products uh, run afoul. And something that's going on currently is with General Motors. They've recently been found to be negligent, uh, recently found that their, uh, their, uh, their executives actually knew about a defect, uh, defect. Again, very similar to the Pinot case back in the 70s. Now, this is 2015 when I'm recording this, but uh, chances are this kind of stuff is, is, is not going to go away. And so as a manager, you know, you, as an ethical manager, you have to be the one that looks at very carefully potential liability for your products and says, are we doing all we can to inform the consumer of potential issues here? Are we being upfront? Are we covering up things, uh, known defects, right? That'll get you in a lot of trouble. And many a company, many executive have fallen because they've been found to have covered up a known defect in a product that later out later on uh, harm people. And uh, classic uh, business ethics in this regard is the is the Tylenol uh, case where Tylenol uh, put some products on the shelf and some people died. And Johnson and Johnson uh, had what was considered at the time a very exemplary response. They did the right thing, and they pulled uh, they pulled all their products off the shelf. This was Tylenol. They pulled it all off the shelf, and they probably lost a lot of money. They had to throw all that batch away and re you know repackage, re redo their batch. Uh, lots of PR stuff went on, and they really regained the confidence of the public uh, because they were very upfront about it. And so it seems like nowadays. Uh, the approach is to do what's called a mea culpa, right? That's a Latin word for my mistake, my bad, I did it, you know, raise your hand. And, yep, we did it, we screwed up, uh, but here's what we're going to do uh, to make it good, right? So that seems to be the conventional wisdom uh, when it comes to having product safety issue these days. Now, the next one here is truth in advertising. And this is kind of a tricky one now, right? Because if any of you have been involved in... Uh, marketing you know that really the 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 basis of marketing in a lot of ways is to emphasize the good you know to really put the spin on it to put the happy face on it you know think about all the the, the marketing lingo and slogans and jazz that, that you know that people try to put over on us today and you're really getting a lot of the, the good side you never see the downside although again you know you get all the disclaimer notice uh, especially for uh, for drugs, it seems like now the, the drug commercials runs a minute. Uh, they spend 10 seconds uh, touting the virtues of how you'll have a better life if you buy this product, but then they spend the other 50 seconds on potential, you know, warnings. You know, warning, don't take this if you're pregnant or blah, 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 right? It goes on and on and on. So, uh, truth in advertising. And again, from a Christian perspective, I think this is a challenging one too, because you know, we, we believe that telling the truth is a virtue, right? That's an important value for us. So, so how can a Christian be involved in the marketing industry when it's inherently one that puts spin on and kind of glosses over possible problems, right? So this is a challenge for those of you that are, that are believers that are going into marketing. I think, again, this kind of goes back to that voicing your values question we talked about right up front. You know, where do you draw the line in terms of how much, uh, you know, how much marketing hype are you willing to put into uh, certain product that you are called to advertise. Uh, then there's special fiduciary responsibilities and some some particular issues, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, industries uh, have what's called fiduciary responsibility. This is where you actually are responsible for uh, perhaps somebody's livelihood, a large amount of finances, right? So if, you're a fidu if you have fiduciary responsibility, it means that you oversee somebody's significant assets and you have a right, you have an obligation to speak up uh, when those assets could be in jeopardy. Uh, let's move ahead here, the employer-employee contract. Uh, and again, this is something that, um, you know, we talked about this in organizational behavior, but when people start off working, there's certain unspoken expectations, rights, uh, consideration that they will expect that, uh, that that they get from their from their employer. And so, again, people won't necessarily write this down, um, because you can't stipulate every little thing, but people have a certain sense of expectation and rights and due consideration that they will get as a result of being an employee there, and you need to be aware of that. Uh, you can't violate that. 
Uh, you may want to be upfront in your hiring processes. You know, if there's in your particular industry, if there's something that people might, you know, expect kind of quid pro quo. Uh, you know, for example, you know, this is kind of a mundane one. You know, but uh, say uh, you're a restaurant or a fast food restaurant, right? Uh, you know, people might expect that they get free food, free French fries, you know, they can drink all the soda they want. Well, if you want to give your stuff away, great, you know, but that should be part of the explicit rights that employees get, uh, not something they can assume, right? Okay, uh, let's move on to another one here, which is called use of corporate resources, right? And so people feel like they work for an organization and, you know, nobody's watching them, right? And so they might be able to take advantage of certain resources uh, that they can get, right? Uh, now, some of the, the more subtle ones here are things like use of corporate reputation. Now, what does that mean? Uh, that means where, where they sort of leverage the name, the brand, if you will, for their own personal gain. You know, so maybe, uh, maybe somebody does a little consulting on the side and uh, they decide to use the letterhead of the corporation, right, to send out uh, letters on, right? So, well, it's not really the company's business, right? That's their own personal business, uh, but they're leveraging the reputation of the brand in order to promote their own thing, right? So that's, that's a misuse of corporate resources. Uh, corporate financial resources. Now, you know, obviously this can get into criminal behavior here if somebody is helping themselves to, uh, you know, uh, petty cash or even, you know, larger issues where they're doing wire transfers into hidden accounts. I mean, there's been all kinds of crazy stuff where people uh, siphon off corporate funds. And again, this goes even beyond ethics. You know, if you remember our grid, the overlap between uh, ethics and the law, to me, this one kind of starts, well, this one that clearly verges down into unethical behavior. But sometimes it's a little more, you know, it's a little more subtle. You know, uh, you know, for an example, you know, is it okay to take home a paper clip? Well, you know, if somebody accidentally puts a paper clip in their pocket, it's probably no big deal. Uh, can they take a box of paper clips home? Well, you know, now, you know, again, it's probably still only like a $2 item, but it's, you know, it's a little bit more. And, you know, then you get to bigger issues, you know. Can somebody take a computer home, right? Can they take a printer? Can they take a, a painting off of the wall? Um, you know, whatever your industry has. Maybe it's uh, uh, electronics or something like that. You know, imagine a guy that works at a music store, right? I'm a musician. Boy, it would sure be tempting for me to, I'm just going to take this guitar home, you know, and use it for the weekend, <laughs> right? So that's why I'll probably never work at a music store. I'd be too tempted. It's like a it's like a mouse in a cheese factory, right? So you have to have policies about stuff like that. And, you know, sadly, a lot of corporations uh, police their people. They got cameras in there, a uh, great TV show. Boy, I can't think of the name of it, but uh, where they, they kind of do these sting operations, like in restaurants and whatnot and, and, and uh, companies, and they just catch people taking off. All kinds of stuff, all kinds of liberty, uh, giving their friends free drinks, you know, or, uh, you know, giving out uh, two drinks, but charging the, only charging the customer for one and, you know, park, pocketing the money. There's no end of potential, you know, crazy financial uh, mis mishaps that can happen there. And then providing honest information. All right. I'm not going to say too much about that, but that's pretty self-evident. Now, okay, let's talk a little bit here in conclusion about whistleblowing. And whistleblowing is a bit of a euphemism for those of you that are not uh, native to our culture. But, you know, if you're in trouble, if you see somebody in trouble and you can't get attention, what do you do? You blow a whistle really loud. And so the, this term has come to, uh, to stand for people within a company who see a serious ethical malfeasance, who I can't get the attention of the corporate executives and therefore they have to go outside. They have to blow the whistle, so to speak, to sound the alarm so that people will pay attention because, because a whistleblower believes uh, that there's something serious going on here and that it's their responsibility to do something, right? So again, this would be one of those you know, giving voices to values kinds of things. You might even ask ahead of time, boy, what would have to happen in this, com in this company for me to get so, uh, you know, so concerned about uh, that we were so seriously breach my own personal ethics that I would actually go outside of the company and blow the whistle. So let's quickly talk about how to blow the whistle if you ever happen to be in the unfortunate situation where you need to do that. And then we'll talk about some considerations to think about before you blow the whistle. And again, my hope and prayer for all of you is that you would never be in this kind of situation here. Uh, where you have to blow the whistle. But uh, these are good things to think about. Again, we're, we're kind of helping you to position yourself for the worst. 
uh, to think responsibly so that on that day, and Lord you know, unwilling, I'll say that, but if unfortunately, if that would ever happen, uh, you would have some ideas of what you could do. All right, so the first thing you want to do before you blow the whistle, right, is to approach your immediate manager. Say, hey, you know, I'm seeing this thing going on here. Uh, it doesn't seem right to me. Are you aware of this? Is the, some, is the company, is somebody in the company aware of this? And uh, what would you do if your manager said, well, don't worry about it, you know? Well, this is kind of where you get back to the, you know, what we talked about in the psychological approaches to decision making, this diffusion of responsibility, right? Well, my boss says it's okay. Uh, you know, so that's when you kind of have to make a principled decision and say, well, my boss says it's okay, but I really don't think this is okay. Uh, the next thing is uh, discuss the issue with your family. Now, why do you think that that is, uh, is a concern here? Well, because chances are if you blow the whistle, if you go above people's heads, if you go outside uh, of the chain of command, uh, you could lose your job, right? So are you so principled now that you're willing to give up your job uh, to sacrifice your family's well-being in order to stand on your principles? Uh, the next thing here is to take it to the next level, right? So this is where you'd go over your boss's head, you'd go to corporate headquarters, whatever that next level might be. Uh, then contact your company's ethics officer or OMS, but ombudsman. Now, uh, you may be in a smaller firm and you might not have all these things, but if it's a bigger firm and it's been around for any length of time, uh, it does have these things, right? So you may need to take it to the ethics officer. Consider going outside of your chain of command. We talked a little bit about that already. Uh, go outside of the company. All right, now this is when it gets serious, right? And this is when you know you have those secret meetings, you know, and you you know, you, you, you check to make sure your phone isn't tapped, you know, and you, you meet, you know, you, you put on a trench coat and you meet somewhere in secret and you, you find, uh, you know, uh, somebody who works for the New York Times, you know, the Chicago Sun, you know. Uh, we've all seen the movies about stuff like this, right, where somebody goes outside and they find somebody in the press and, you know, usually the press is more than happy to go to bat, uh, unless, of course, the company happens to be a, uh, something like Planned Parenthood or some, uh, you know, far, you know, extreme, uh, uh, politically favored kind of organization. Now, I hate to get political on y'all, but that's going on these days. But, but chances are, um, somebody in the press is willing to entertain what you're talking about. And of course, leaving the company. Now, you might be so principled and say, "Well, um, you know, I, I can't deal here, deal with this anymore." And maybe you don't want to blow the whistle. You know, maybe you're like, "This is not my battle to fight." Uh, you don't want to go down. You don't want to, you know, burn bridges and those kinds of things. You just decide to leave the company. And I've had students tell me before, yeah, I was in a situation that was really bad. Uh, I decided to leave the company. I will never work for a company that does that again. Now, uh, before you blow the whistle, uh, here's some things to consider. And again, go back to your voicing values, giving voice to values. And that will help you to uh, th pre-think some of these things here, I believe. How strongly do you feel about the issue? What are your intentions? Now, this is a good one here because sometimes you might be mad at a person. You might be mad at an executive or somebody who did you wrong or somebody who didn't give you that raise or promotion. And you just want to get that guy, right? So you're really not concerned about justice or fairness. You're concerned about pulling that guy down. Well, you know, that might be a reason not to blow the whistle if it's kind of a personal, you know, vengeance kind of thing. Uh, just remember scripture, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, right? So let those things go. Uh, think about power and influence. Uh, weigh the risks and benefits. Uh, consider the timing, right? So sometimes you might say, ah, this is a good thing. I need to do it, but this is not a good time. And then develop alternatives. And Lord willing, boy, you'll, you'll see a third way. Sometimes we kind of tend to see black or white, left or right. Uh, but I believe that there's a lot of situations where there's an alternative where you can find a solution. Uh, and again, this takes a lot of wisdom. And uh, as, a, as a believer, I, I believe the Lord would help you in, in prayer to come up with some clever alternatives here that wouldn't risk your livelihood, uh, all the potential you know, harm and uh, you know, crud you would go through if you became a whistleblower. So that's about all I want to say about that. Uh, and this kind of concludes our PowerPoint presentation. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. What we're going to do in discussion this week is we're going to have a set of case studies which will allow you to pick a case study that, uh, that, that tackles one of these particular types of uh, common ethical issues. And you'll be able to describe your approach. You'll be able to use the eight-step method that we talked about in chapters one and two 
and apply those to helping you decide how you would uh, how you would uh, come to terms with and how would you address that particular ethical issue. All right, so I hope this was helpful. And again, I look forward to working with you in discussion as we get some practice at dealing with the common ethical issues that managers face. Bless you all. See you online. Mm -hmm.